and welcome to the first MCSB podcast of the new academic year at the University of Glasgow. So my name is Lucy Alford and I am a research associate from the Dow Davis lab and I am particularly interested in using insect neuropeptides to develop um, new generation target specific and greener insecticides and I'm joined with Phil. So I'm Phil Robinson, uh, I'm a postdoc in Neil Bullitt's lab and I'm interested in protein folding and specifically looking at the formation of disulfide bonds. And today we are speaking to Professor Lynn Regan, who has recently been appointed the Chair in Interdisciplinary Science at the Centre for Synthetic and Systems Biology at the University of Edinburgh after 28 years at the Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. So welcome, Lynn. To begin with, uh, in layman's terms, could you give us an overview of your research interests? So I study how proteins work. So if you think about your body, then everything in your body really works because of proteins, your hair, your nails, your hemoglobin, your hormones, everything's done by proteins. So I spent some time figuring out what makes a protein a protein and what are the sort of physical properties of the components, the chemical components of proteins, and also try to design new proteins First off, to test if we really understood how proteins really are constructed, and then more recently, to see, well, can we make new proteins that might be useful for something based on the knowledge we have of existing proteins or ways to design new things. And so where would you say that this field is going in terms of the next big developments in even the long term, the next 50 years, what do you think the where this field will head? Well, I think we will. We're not quite finished with using design approaches to understand proteins. Certainly at the moment to design something that you know for sure will interact with something else, even though that seems like a relatively small challenge, we can't do that as well as you can do it by random selection or by injecting something into an animal and making antibodies. We can't, we'd like to be able to do that. So we're not quite good as nature is at doing these things yet? No, but when we make our little tiny steps, we try and figure out why we've gone wrong or why it's worked, so that when the next time comes around, we can do it better. But I think you'll see more of people making things out of proteins, I think, t to do a variety of applications. We have some work to make anti-glint surfaces, to make scaffolds for protein um, engineering for stem cell um, differentiation. If you think just what our bodies and the bodies of any animal, plant, any li living thing you can think of, there are a huge variety of structures which are mainly proteins, then there are a lot of things that we can do. Plus, Proteins have the advantage of being, you know, naturally kind of quote unquote green, biodegradable, they're more sustainable, we can make them easily. So that's what I think. Because uh, something that I've observed in this field uh, at the time I've worked in it is that the structural biology uh, information is getting greater and greater every mm -hmm. year in a really kind of vast amount of mm -hmm. information. And so we're getting these high resolution structures of proteins, but we're still, uh, we don't understand how those structures form. So we understand the, mm -hmm. the end point, we don't understand how we get there. Yeah. And I think that feeds into what you're saying about protein engineering, developing new proteins, if we can understand those steps. Yeah, I think, so one thing that was surprising when I first started doing protein design a long time ago was we come up with, come up with a sequence and we're just aiming for the end point not thinking, oh, we have to design in the pathway for them to fold or anything. And they just did it. They just would spontaneously fold. You mentioned the huge number of structures, and I collaborate still with Professor Corey O'Hearn in physics and engineering at Yale, and we actually studied the very highest resolution, the 1.0 or 1.7 angstrom resolution structures, to inform if we're trying to say computationally think how do we best mimic those, then we pay a lot of attention to those high results. And so the fact that there are many, many more than there used to be is a real help to this yeah. sort of work. Yeah. Okay, and so what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, in your research? 
Well, the big, actually, the current challenge, I wouldn't say it's the biggest, but a current challenge is how to analyze things that are sort of an intermediate size or on a surface, for example. So you mentioned crystal structures, or there's a range of solution methods you can use to look at small proteins, and so I think that's okay. But when we start making like supramolecular complexes or things on surfaces, then knowing you've got what you intended, there aren't a huge number of methods to do that. You sort of have, so this idea of okay, build, test, you know, learn, cycle. If you haven't got the learn part, that makes it difficult. And but those are some of the most interesting things you'd like to make, right? These yeah. New we see from your website that you were active in public engagement and you participated in Soapbox Science in Edinburgh. Can you tell us a bit more about this experience? Yes, I, I did that when I was on sabbatical here in 2016 and I think we just all got the flyer emails about it. And Soapbox Science is to change the perception with the general public of what a scientist looks like. And so the idea of women doing various different things, um, different types of science, I mean, so from biology to geology to physics to everything. And we literally, we had a little bit of training and we literally stood on soapboxes in the drizzle on <laughs> Princess Street in Edinburgh. And I think there were six of us and we had a little 15 minute talks and I talked about what a shop proteins <laughs> and I used Lego and Tyrion Lannister as an example of a protein protein interaction that's been affected by mutation and my fellow speakers were just incredible they talked about many different things to, like from fracking to climate change all sorts of things it wasn't that we were just we were just talking about what we were interested in and we happened hopefully to be normal looking women who were talking about this as opposed to the kind of stereotypic caricature of a bald guy with glasses <laughs> and uh, lab coat. Yeah, sounds, sounds fantastic. Mm. So what do you think, um, how important do you think such outreach activities are for bridging the gap between us scientists and the general general public? I think they're very important. We just did one, my current nascent lab at Edinburgh. We just did Leaf Labs, which was a Saturday afternoon at the Ocean Terminal Shopping Centre. And we did a similar kind of thing with um, using Lego to kind of talk about proteins and trying to engage with people. I think part of it was just to me that the people doing it, my students and the students on Labs Next Door, are just like normal people and then just talking about how to think about things scientifically. I would add that I recently went, there was um, an Ada Lovelace Day event in chemistry at Edinburgh and I stopped by that and I was speaking to some chemistry undergrads who told me that they were the only woman girl in their class for A-level physics and chemistry. Wow. Now, that's what it was like for me <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> many years ago, so I was a bit disappointed that, that it's still like yeah, that. Yeah, not much has changed. Okay. Yeah. I also would say that the idea, if you are not from a family who has gone to university and know much about science, then there are many parts of science that are good careers and good jobs for people to go into. And just the idea that they're there mm -hmm. and doing science is a good career path for people that I think are perhaps... Certainly my family, when I was growing up, didn't know that. Um, so I would like to just spread that word also. Absolutely. What do you think of social media then? Because it's a bit of a Marmite thing where you either love it or hate it. How do you feel social media fits into your current science? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> so I don't feel comfortable tweeting because I'm sure that I'm too off the cuff and glib in my remarks to want anything to be that permanent. But we have, with my fellow labs, the Nakayama and Wallace labs, we have started our joint lab Instagram account, at which if you go to that, you can see pictures of us at Leaf Labs. Fantastic, and what is the Instagram name? to access your account? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I have to say I don't do it. It's my lab manager, Louise Holyoke, who does it. It's not a problem. We can find this yeah. information out and we'll put it all in the description yeah. box below the podcast. Mm. So what do you see as the big misconceptions that the public have about science? 
I think this idea that you are different from them, that the pit scientists are different from normal people, and you never, I, it was almost one of my pet wishes that there'd be some sort of TV program that was about the lives of people in a lab, like they do for lawyers and for medicine and stuff, that people are, are doing science and they're thinking scientifically, but they're like normal people, they're not some sort of eccentrics living in their own little world. And I think the other thing connected then to that is just, I think, thinking about things with that scientific way of doing it. So, for example, if you look at a product and they say proteins, like there's going to be proteins in your shampoo that are going to make your hair look like silk, and then you think, well, is that really true? Or if this company says, oh, you need to have these branch chain amino acids to build bodies with, and then you think, well, but that's the website of a company that's trying to sell me these branch chain amino acids. So, so that sort of, I think it would be applying scientific thinking to many things in real life. <laughs> we, we now have the Big Bang Theory, though, mm -hmm. which, oh, is yeah. about, <laughs> which is about research scientists. So whenever, whenever, I speak to anyone and it's like, oh, yeah. I'm a research scientist. They're like, oh, I like Sheldon Cooper mm -hmm. from Big Bang Theory. And it's like, yes and no. <laughs> I think with TV science, they always make progress so much quicker than in real well, life. that's true. And try, <laughs> that's trying to communicate true. that yeah. across is yeah. often the most difficult thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've never seen the Big Bang Theory, but aren't they a bit sort of geeky in it? Bit yes, they yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I had thought. I'd like to show that people are not even like that. I mean, it's a yeah. start, but... Yeah, a bit more normal. I think everyone here, we're very normal people. Yeah. <laughs> you're originally from the UK, but established your career and worked long-term in the States. Uh, but now you've recently moved back to the UK. Uh, what are the biggest differences between the university systems and working in the States versus working here? Well, one thing, when I first went to the US to do my PhD at MIT, one thing that wasn't different was that I was amongst other people who were interested in science and doing science, and so it was actually not a big shock. Going outside MIT into the real world was, but not in that. Um, I th one thing that I have noticed is just the structure of PhD programs is quite different. That It's more in the UK. It's more like it used to be when I was thinking about PhDs, which was you think about who you'd want to work with as opposed to entering what we would call in these states a graduate program here, you'd call it a CDT or something. That's what I've, pretty much everywhere that I've been associated with has had training programs and there's a more of a sense of there's a cohort and that's the people in your year that I don't get the feeling there's a similar sort of thing here. Um, what do you like most about being in the UK? I like the fact that I can cycle to lab every day and I don't have to drive. That's really I nice. like that. <laughs> um, and I, Edinburgh is a very beautiful place and I like the colleagues and people who are there. But my quality of life, the idea that I usually I don't need to have a car. I can walk most places or get the bus in Edinburgh nice and accessible to the countryside around as well, uh, Edinburgh. It's yeah. a nice city to live yeah. in. Yeah. I actually think that's one of the great things about Scotland in general, like being here in Glasgow, you literally just need to drive a couple of miles mm -hmm. down the road and suddenly you're in the Trossachs and Loch Lomond and yeah. just really mm -hmm. out in the beautiful yeah beautiful wildlife. Our institute has recently won an Athena Swan Award, which for anyone who isn't familiar with this, it um, aims to promote women in science and tackle gender inequality. So as a leading woman in science, what do you think are the biggest challenges in this area, if at all? I think we need more women in leadership positions and we need it not to be acceptable to have, say, on a hiring committee, I think, just one, the token woman, and that woman's supposed to speak for everyone else. I think studies have shown that you need about a third of any committee for it not to be the woman's opinion, but just the opinion of those groups of people. Yes. And so I think that's an important thing to do to change things. Mm -hmm. Um, what advice would you give to young budding scientists who are considering uh, continuing in science? 
I would say you have to really love the doing of the science. I mean, I still, we just ran our first gel in my Edinburgh lab and I was so excited to stood there with my undergrad. Yeah. You have to take a joy in the everyday things. You can't think, oh, well, I'm doing this because one day I'm going to, like, you know, stop the TB crisis or something. You have to have a, you have to enjoy doing it. And I think you want to work on something that's important because I think there's no point working on something that just you and the people in your lab care about. You have to think a little bit in the bigger picture that is this something worth worth working on because you're going to devote all your time to working on that, but you need to take joy in the little triumphs. And Absolutely. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're just going to finish up now with some very quick fire questions just to get to know you as a person. So, firstly, favourite book? Um, favourite book I read ever? I can't do ever. I can do a book I read recently. Um, there was a book of short stories called Redeployment, which was about a guy who had been in the US Army and he then he went and did a literature um, degree, I think. At, Dartmouth or vice versa and they were really very powerful and I, they stuck with me. Fantastic. Favourite food? Curry. <laughs> Favourite city? Edinburgh. Ah, oh, <laughs> we're in the right place then. <laughs> uh, Favourite musician? Well, I like the Rolling Stones. Oh, <laughs> good one then. Did you see them recently on their new filter tour? They were no. in Edinburgh in no. the summer. They're a bit yeah. old <laughs> Oh, they've still got it. <laughs> Favourite film? Well, it, it used to be Apocalypse Now. I think we'll keep that for the moment. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good one. Uh, Favourite hobby? I knit. I knit oh. and I run. Wow. And I hike. Nice. I, I try to learn to knit and I'm fine with the whole knit mm. one, pull one, but as soon as you have to start doing patterns, I'm just losing it and dropping stitches. But you can, you know, there's so much good wool now that even sometimes you want to do knit one or just knit all, pearl all, because I show the texture of the wool and so actually you don't want to be doing anything fancy. Yeah. That's, um, that's quite, uh, good advice. Maybe I'll pick up my, my knitting needles yes, again. Yes. <laughs> um, childhood ambition. Well, I when I first, I always liked, apparently, this is what people who knew me, I liked maths. And at one point, before I'd done any science, I thought I wanted to do maths, though I didn't really know what that entailed. I just And then I thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher of maths. But... Um, Apparently, I used to always be kind of pulling things apart and um, taking the backs of my dolls and stuff. <laughs> and so people who knew me as a child sort of said I was kind of inquisitive, I guess. Okay, we had to ask this one. What's your favourite protein? Oh, well, <laughs> I think, you know, it's like choosing mostly children, right? <laughs> Well, I, I'm cur- well, the favourite point is whichever one I'm working on at the moment. I'm very fond of our designed TPR proteins, um, but it changes with which one we can make in very large quantities. Do you have any claim to fame or who is the most famous person you've ever met? Oh, well, the most famous generally known person was Mary Beard, who came to give a talk at Yale because oh, yeah. her former student was there, and I had a little chat with her afterwards. That's kind of like the mainstream fame person. But science-wise, I know quite a lot of... It's hard to choose between the never lovers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you weren't a scientist, what would you have chosen as an alternative career? You know, I don't think that I can picture one because I liked doing this and it's not like the nine to five job thing I just like it a lot and all the various aspects of it I can't I don't think I have something else that I can picture doing thank you very much for chatting us to to us today Lynn and we shall see you in the next podcast